Well, I know it's spring, not only because of warming weather and blooming sakura trees, but also because of a convergence of religious festivals. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Muslim holy month of Ramadan began recently and is ongoing. We celebrate Palm Sunday today, and also we celebrate Purim today. The colorful Hindu festival Holi is tomorrow, and we'll declare Friday good, even though it was nothing of the sort. Then, of course, next Sunday, we rejoice at Easter, the culmination of our Christian celebration of rebirth. The spring holidays are human responses to nature's cycle of birth, death-like sleep, and renewal, but they also encourage individuals to consider their actions in the world. Muslims fast during Ramadan as Christians fast during Lent, not to deny themselves, but to focus mind, body, and soul on a palpable connection with God, with Allah. And the connection is made so that we become better servants to one another. Purim and Palm Sunday commemorate how that powerful God connection inspires leaders like Esther and Jesus to serve their people by speaking out against their oppressors. I've started to consider that rather than celebrating Jesus as the king he never wanted to be, entering a land he never wanted to rule, Palm Sunday instead should recall Purim and the acts of courage that both Esther and Jesus exemplify. The Book of Esther is a novella. It's fiction. It's a form of writing very, very popular in Persia and the ancient Near East. It's unlikely that any of the characters in Esther are real. Even King Xerxes, based on the 5th century BCE king, is highly fictionalized. In the story, Esther was a Jew living under the protection of her uncle Mordecai in Persian exile. After King Xerxes banished his queen Vashti because she refused to parade around naked in front of his drunken drinking buddies, a beauty contest was held to find Xerxes a new bride. Uh, I did mention it was the 5th century BCE, right? Xerxes chose Esther, but she kept her Jewishness a secret. Now, there are many reasons for her secretiveness, but in part, this is probably the author's response to the fact that Persian kings never actually married outside of one of seven royal families. At any rate, shortly thereafter, Xerxes promoted a consultant named Haman to the role of chief advisor. Haman demands everyone bow down to him. Mordecai, uh, Esther's cousin, refuses to bow, so Haman plots to kill not only Mordecai, but also all the Jewish exiles in Persia. In response, and after a couple of banquets to ease tensions, Esther tells Xerxes that she is a Jew, revealing a deception that could have gotten her killed. But she does this to call out Haman's plot to commit genocide against her people. In Esther chapter 7, verses 3 to 7, Then Queen Esther answered, <clears throat> if, I have found major, uh, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Uh, the story does not end well for Haman, who actually finally gets it in the end. Esther and Song of Songs are the only two works of scripture that do not specifically mention God. Orthodox Judaism understands this absence as an example of how God works through individuals and circumstances uh, instead of sort of supernaturally from the outside. Now, that is a massive evolution in thought from a plague-sending God who speaks to Moses to a God who's now working through and inspiring us from within. It's an idea that's foundational to understanding Jesus. I suspect that the book of Esther shaped Jesus from a very young age and is possibly directly responsible for his willingness to enter Jerusalem through a service entrance as the Roman emperor paraded through town on war elephants. 
I think it's also necessary to remember that Jesus would have read about Esther for Purim for at least 30 years. I mean, she had to leave an impression. And I think scripture records that she did. Uh, check this verse out from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 15. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Make no mistake about it. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on a donkey was an intentional mocking of the emperor astride his war horses. I think Jesus was encouraged to this seditious act in part because of Esther's inspiration. That's why this Palm Sunday, I'm also thinking about Esther and how I choose to speak truth to power with courage and love. Amen. Our question for consideration today is whose courage and love inspires you and why? Whose courage and love inspires you and why? Let's think about that for a few moments.